I often question if I'm the ideal husband. My job can be quite demanding, and admittedly, there are times when I return home with a bit of a sour mood. I may not be the epitome of financial success either. While I'm no millionaire, we manage to live comfortably. Our home is pleasant. We own two nice cars. My wife enjoys a wardrobe full of lovely clothes, and our eight-year-old daughter, Vanessa, is surrounded by plenty of pricey toys. Ultimately, I see myself as a straightforward, hard-working man who deeply cares for his wife and family. Gloria and I have shared almost 12 years of marital bliss, though lately, a shadow has fallen over our relationship. Something feels off between us, a subtle shift that's difficult to pinpoint. Gloria has been distant, exhibiting an aloofness I've never seen before. She's been quick to find fault with me over trivial matters, which is unlike her at all. I've attempted to broach the subject, asking if there's something bothering her that she's not sharing, but like many spouses, she brushes it off, attributing her behavior to fatigue or a rough day. Initially, I hope to give her space to sort through whatever is troubling her, but her detached demeanor is wearing thin and starting to grate on my nerves. Apart from her demeanor, any married couple knows that relationship issues with your spouse tend to spill over into the bedroom. I've always made an effort to keep our love life lively and spontaneous. Being a romantic at heart, I often surprised Gloria with gestures like bringing home a dozen roses after work to kickstart foreplay. In the past, these actions reliably led to intimate moments later in the evening. However, lately, my romantic efforts were met with mere gratitude and a quick kiss on the cheek. Instead of appreciating the gestures for what they were, it seemed as if Gloria interpreted them as attempts to make amends for some imagined wrongdoing. For weeks now, Gloria hadn't shown any initiative in intimacy, and her responses to my advances ranged from being not in the mood to citing the classic excuse of a headache. Even on the rare occasions when she acquiesced, she remained passive, leaving me to do all the work. As time went on, I found myself mentally withdrawing from the situation. I'd come home, spend time with our daughter, and consciously avoid interacting with Gloria as much as possible, which only served to exacerbate the situation. Feeling increasingly desperate, I took moments at work to reflect on how everything had started and whether I might have inadvertently triggered Gloria's change in behavior. However, my attempts at introspection yielded no answers. I replayed countless scenarios in my mind, attempting to dissect the possible causes behind Gloria's behavior. The more I pondered, the more an unthinkable possibility kept resurfacing. Could my wife be having an affair? I vehemently denied such a notion, reassuring myself that she would never betray our marriage. Yet every time I tried to piece together the puzzle, it seemed like there was a third element, me, Gloria, and a potential lover. Despite my attempts to dismiss the idea, curiosity got the better of me. I delved into articles about signs of infidelity looking for changes in behavior, attire, and routines. Admittedly, I hadn't noticed any significant shifts in Gloria's appearance or habits, but my interactions with her were primarily limited to evenings after work. Who knows how she presents herself during the day or what her schedule entails? Yet, some of the telltale signs of infidelity seemed uncomfortably familiar, particularly her altered attitudes towards me. The thought of hiring a private investigator crossed my mind, but without concrete evidence, it seemed premature and unjustifiable. All I had were suspicions, nothing substantial enough to justify the expense of hiring a PI, so I began conducting my own investigations, resorting to small measures like calling home during the day to see if Gloria was there, albeit yielding inconsistent results. I decided to take matters into my own hands and acquired an old surveillance camera to discreetly install under the eaves of our garage. Connecting it to a hidden tape unit tucked away behind some paint cans, I aimed to monitor any unfamiliar vehicles approaching our home. However, after two weeks of surveillance, there were no signs of any suspicious cars. There were occasions when I observed Gloria leaving the house, only for her to later claim she had been home all day. However, her absences were brief, seemingly too short for anything significant to occur, unless her potential paramour was remarkably swift. It's possible these outings were merely mundane errands she deemed unworthy of mention, hardly proof of an extramarital affair. 
As time passed, my suspicions persisted despite the absence of concrete evidence. Gloria's mood deteriorated, and our intimate moments became increasingly rare, leaving me frustrated and resentful. With our 12th anniversary approaching, I saw an opportunity to inject some excitement back into our marriage. I suggested we celebrate with a night out, something we hadn't done in ages. Perhaps a dinner and dancing would reignite the spark between us. Eager for a chance to reconnect, we arranged for Vanessa to stay the night at my parents' house, allowing us the freedom to enjoy ourselves without any time constraints. I reserved a table at Plato's Place, a restaurant Gloria adored. As the major d' led us to our table, I hoped to recapture some of the enchantment of our earlier years. However, Gloria appeared somewhat tense for reasons I couldn't quite discern. Ordering a bottle of wine seemed to ease her, gradually restoring her usual demeanor. Our conversation flowed effortlessly, regaining its playful tone. Following dinner, I sensed Gloria's eagerness to hit the dance floor. Though I suggested trying out a new club, she persuaded me to revisit our usual spot, a cozy venue with dim lighting and a dance floor catering to an older crowd. Given its ambience and music selection, it wasn't a hard sell. Dancing had always been one of our shared passions, a mutual interest that initially drew us together. Finding a secluded table, we indulged in a few drinks before gracefully gliding onto the dance floor, showcasing our moves with nostalgic flair. It felt like a return to old times, both of us relishing the moment. After nearly an hour of continuous dancing, fatigue began to set in, prompting us to retreat to our table for a brief respite. I settled into my chair, but before joining me, Gloria took a sip of her wine and excused herself to visit the restroom. As I watched my wife gracefully move across the dance floor, thoughts of impending intimacy lingered in my mind. However, my focus shifted when I noticed I wasn't the only one captivated by her presence. Across the room, a strikingly handsome man sat alone at a corner table, his gaze fixated on Gloria's every move. A pang of concern shot through me as I observed what seemed like a momentary exchange between them. Did they know each other? As Gloria disappeared into the restroom, I couldn't shake the feeling that the man's eyes lingered on me with a hint of smugness. Though the setting was purely a dance club, I puzzled over why he would be there solo, until it occurred to me that, like Gloria, his companion was likely in the restroom. Maintaining a watchful eye on the man while awaiting Gloria's return, I couldn't ignore the unsettling sense of suspicion creeping back in. When Gloria asked me to fetch another glass of wine, I hesitated. The thought of her sitting alone while I waited at the bar didn't sit well with me. Catching the attention of one of the barmaids, I opted for a more prompt service, though I couldn't shake the feeling of disappointment in Gloria's eyes as the young woman approached to take our order. I had a sinking feeling that the evening was about to take a turn for the worse. It was a gut instinct I couldn't shake. Glancing over my shoulder, I noticed the same man still sitting alone in the corner, confirming my suspicion that he was indeed by himself. Who's the guy over in the corner? I asked, catching Gloria off guard momentarily. I thought I detected a hint of panic in her eyes before she swiftly regained her composure. What guy? She responded innocently, though her tone betrayed a hint of discomfort. The guy over there, I persisted, the one you exchanged glances with on your way to the bathroom. Gloria's denial came quickly. Honey, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't exchange glances with anyone. Just as our drinks arrived, I noticed Gloria's eyes darting past me. Turning, I saw the man approaching our table, bypassing me entirely as he addressed Gloria with a request to dance. No thanks, I interjected sharply, my tone revealing my displeasure. His response was mocking. I was talking to the lady, he retorted with a smirk. Yeah, well the lady is my wife, and I decide who she dances with, I snapped back, feeling a surge of indignation. Gloria intervened, attempting to diffuse the tension. Darren, you're being rude, she admonished gently. Rude? Do you even know this guy? I demanded, catching her off guard with the question. He's the one I was talking about. I don't know what's going on between you two, but it's incredibly disrespectful for him to approach my wife without even acknowledging me. Hey, Mr. Lonely attempted to interject, but I swiftly cut him off. Do you mind? 
I'm talking to my wife, and I sure as hell don't need your input, I asserted firmly, turning back to Gloria to continue our conversation. Had he asked if I would mind you two dancing together, I might have considered it, but now, not a chance. I declared firmly, my frustration evident. Darren, you're being silly, Gloria retorted, her tone now edged with impatience. There's nothing going on between this gentleman and me. Yes, we're married, but you don't owe me. I'm not your slave, and if I want to dance with someone, I will. I couldn't believe my wife was speaking to me in such a disrespectful manner. It was a level of disrespect she had never shown before. Though I was seething with anger, I made a conscious effort to control my temper as she continued speaking. Honey, I just want to have some fun, she said, her tone softening. Gloria, it's our anniversary. I want to have fun too, but with you. Sitting here watching you dance with someone else is not my idea of fun, especially after I've asked you not to dance with him. I responded, struggling to maintain composure. Now you're right. I don't own you, and I can't stop you from dancing with him. But if you do, then you'd better get him to take you home too, because I'll be gone. After 12 years together, I could easily decipher Gloria's emotions from her expression. Despite her outward anger, I was surprised she couldn't detect the same emotions mirrored on my face. Well, it's impolite to keep this gentleman waiting while we argue. I'm going to dance with him, and we'll discuss this later, she snapped, her words cutting through the tension. The jackass wore a triumphant smirk as he extended his hand for Gloria to take. She accepted, placing her hand in his as they made their way to the dance floor. I'm certain they didn't notice my departure as I slipped out the door before they even began to dance. By the time my cell phone rang, I was already several blocks away. Where the hell are you? Gloria's voice sounded contrite through the phone. I'm heading home to pack a bag. Why? I responded tersely. There was a moment of silence. What do you mean, pack a bag? Where are you going? She questioned, her tone shifting to confusion. I don't know yet, but I need to get away from you, I stated firmly. I've reached my limit. You can't be serious, Darren. It was just one dance, for heaven's sake. Are you really going to throw away 12 years of marriage over this? She pleaded. It's not just about the dance, Gloria. Why would you want to remain married to someone you don't love or respect? I haven't caught you in the act, but I strongly suspect you're cheating on me, perhaps with the jackass you just danced with. I saw the way you looked at each other when you went to the bathroom. And when he approached our table, he treated me with the same disdain a man shows the husband of the woman he's involved with, none at all. Darren, her voice softened, I do love you, and I respect you. I swear, there was nothing going on between that guy and me. I would never cheat on you. Why would you even think that? You've got to be kidding me. We haven't been intimate in over two weeks, and when we do, you're barely even present. You've been irritable and short-tempered for the past two months. Don't tell me you respect me, because your actions tonight proved otherwise. If you're not having an affair, you're certainly doing a great impression of it. There was a long pause before she responded. I'm sorry, Darren. I, I didn't realize. I'm sorry for how I acted. I'm sorry for tonight. I'm sorry I gave you reason to think I'm having an affair. Another brief pause. I guess I did glance at that guy on the way to the restroom. He, he was attractive. I noticed him while we were dancing too, but I'm not having an affair with him. Please, honey, please just come back and pick me up. We can talk about it. Nope. Like I said, I've had enough. I told you if you danced with that guy, you'd have to find your own way home, and I meant it. I'm pulling into our driveway right now. By the time you get home, I'll be gone. If you are having an affair, maybe you should just go home with your lover boy and forget about me. Honey, please believe me, I'm not having an affair. Look, I'll grab a cab, but please just stay there until I get home. Gloria pleaded, desperation evident in her voice, a stark contrast from earlier. We need to talk this out. Please, I'll be home shortly, she begged before abruptly ending the call. Upon arriving home, I swiftly packed a bag and left the house within 12 minutes. Curiosity nagged at me. Would Gloria really take a cab home, or would the jackass drop her off? I drove down the block, switched off my lights, and waited. Fifteen minutes later, a yellow cab pulled into the driveway. Gloria hurriedly exited and darted into the house. 
Satisfied with what I saw, I headed for a motel. Almost immediately, my phone began to ring again. I switched it off. Though I lacked concrete evidence of infidelity, my suspicions remained strong. I was nearly convinced that Gloria and the man she danced with knew each other. Perhaps now was the time to hire that private detective. If I wasn't at home, maybe she would seek solace from her lover. The following day, I scored the yellow pages for the most promising private investigator. After visiting his office and providing a retainer, I headed to work. My secretary, Joan, informed me that Gloria had called 20 times already and something was amiss. I explained our marital issues and my decision not to return her calls. Instructing Joan to relay this message, I also informed the receptionist not to allow Gloria entry to the offices if she showed up. I needed to give the PI a chance to uncover the truth. Now, it was a waiting game. Later that afternoon, I received a call from Andrea, our neighbor. Anticipating that it would concern Gloria, I answered despite my reluctance. Darren, she began, Gloria told me what happened the other night. She's been desperately trying to apologize, but she says you won't speak to her. That's correct, I replied firmly. I have nothing to discuss with her. I detected a sign on the other end of the line. She also mentioned that you suspect her of cheating on you. You don't actually believe that, do you? I'm afraid I do, I admitted. Her behavior has been peculiar for over two months now. The incident the other night only validated my suspicions. Validated? She said all she did was dance with some guy. No, that's not entirely accurate. I witnessed them exchanging looks before he approached our table. He was exceedingly disrespectful towards me, and Gloria chose to support him, following his lead. Despite my warning her about the consequences, she disregarded my feelings. I'm almost certain those two are involved romantically. Darren, come on. I really think you're jumping to conclusions here. I've been your neighbor for years, and if Gloria was cheating on you, I'm pretty sure I would have noticed something. I've never seen any unfamiliar cars parked outside your house, nor have I seen any strange men coming and going. Please, she knows that dancing with that guy was a mistake. She got upset because you told her not to, but she's realized you were right. Trust me, Darren, I know Gloria, and she wouldn't cheat on you. She loves you, and you know that as well as I do. I'm not so convinced anymore, Andrea. Her actions the other night didn't exactly scream love. Please, Darren, just talk to her. You're never going to resolve anything if you refuse to communicate with her. I knew Andrea was making sense, but I needed time for the private investigator to do his job. Andrea, do me a favor. Let her know I'll call her in a couple of weeks. I still need some time to think things over. Another sigh came through the phone. Okay, Darren, she acquiesced. I'll pass on the message. But please, promise me you'll call her then, all right? I promise, I assured her. After exchanging goodbyes, I found myself contemplating once more. Andrea and her husband, Jack, were close friends, and I couldn't imagine Andrea lying to me. If Gloria was indeed being unfaithful, she was certainly keeping it well hidden. For the following two weeks, I was consumed with anxiety. I reached out to the investigator a couple of times, but each time, he informed me that there was nothing substantial to report. Finally, he summoned me to his office, and as I sat down, my stomach churned with nerves. He slid a manila envelope across the desk toward me, and my hand trembled as I picked it up. You can skip through all the mundane details, he advised, motioning toward the pages. Just head to the bottom of page 5. With shaky fingers, I flipped through the report until I reached the designated page. Could this be the proof I desperately sought? After conducting a thorough investigation, this office has found no evidence to support the client's suspicions of infidelity on the part of his spouse. I felt like the ground had shifted beneath me. Unsure of how to react, I glanced back up at the investigator. Are you certain? I questioned, disbelief coloring my tone. Mr. Barnes, my team has meticulously monitored your wife's every move over the past two weeks. We've observed the house, monitored her communications, and trailed her whenever she left. We've scrutinized her phone records and credit card statements. There's simply no indication of any affair, he affirmed. Relief washed over me in waves, threatening to overwhelm me. I struggled to contain my emotions, 
resisting the urge to break down into tears of relief right there in his office. Go home, Mr. Barnes, the investigator advised gently. Return to your wife and child. In my line of work, happy endings are a rare sight. I expressed my gratitude to the investigator before returning to my motel room. I knew I still needed some time to gather my thoughts. Over the weekend, I mulled over everything that had transpired. By Monday morning, I felt ready to make a crucial call. When Gloria answered, her voice trembled with emotion. Hello. It's me, I replied. Are you okay? You sound upset. There was a brief silence before she spoke again. Darren, oh Darren, I'm so sorry. I just don't know what to do if you don't come back to us. I've tried to be strong for Vanessa, but I can't stop crying. I'm sorry. I realize now that I took you for granted. You were right. I should have made it clear to that guy that I was with my husband and not interested. I showed you no respect, and I don't know why, because I do respect and love you. I promise, Darren, if you give me another chance, I'll never make that mistake again. Her heartfelt plea caught me off guard. It was a stark contrast to her demeanor at the dance club. As I hesitated to respond, she jumped to a conclusion. You're not coming back, are you? She asked, her voice tinged with despair. No, Gloria, I'm coming back, I reassured her, but only on a trial basis. I want my wife back, the woman I fell in love with, the woman I married. She's here, Darren. Truly, she's here waiting for the man she loves, Andrea insisted, her sincerity evident in her voice. We'll see. After everything I've been through, the attitude, the lack of intimacy, the disrespect, I'm still not entirely convinced, Gloria, not yet. I need to go to the motel after work and gather my things, but I'll be home tonight, I informed her. There was a brief pause before Gloria spoke, her voice filled with remorse. I love you, Darren. I'm deeply sorry for the way I treated you. I don't want to lose you. Despite her words, I couldn't shake off my reservations. I was still upset, and despite the evidence to the contrary, I couldn't shake the feeling that Gloria knew the man from the dance hall. After work, I collected my belongings and returned home. Vanessa greeted me enthusiastically at the door, unaware of our recent troubles. Gloria was there too, wrapping her arms around me and showering me with affectionate kisses. In that moment, as I kissed her back with fervor, I couldn't deny that I still loved my wife. That was two years ago, and since then, married life has been nothing short of wonderful. Gloria has once again become the woman I fell in love with, both inside and outside the bedroom. A few months back, she surprised me with a birthday party, a gesture we hadn't done much for my birthday in the past, but became a tradition upon my return. Last night marked our 14th wedding anniversary, and this time, Gloria took charge of planning the entire evening. When I arrived home from work, she greeted me with tickets to a dinner playhouse to see Man of La Mancha, one of my favorite plays. After the show, we took a leisurely drive down to the lakefront and strolled along the beach. With the moon casting its gentle glow and warm breezes blowing in from the lake, it felt like a scene out of a romantic movie. I love you, darling, I whispered, feeling as if we were still in the honeymoon phase of our relationship. And I love you very much, my dear, replied my adored wife, her eyes sparkling with affection. Part 2. Gloria's Side of the Story even though the calendar had officially declared the arrival of spring a couple of weeks earlier, it was only on this day that Gloria could step out of the house without her heavy winter coat. It marked the definitive end of yet another harsh Chicago winter. As she stepped outside, Gloria inhaled deeply, taking in the fresh scent of morning dew that lingered after the gentle April shower overnight. A smile tugged at her lips as she reminisced about the warm and secure feeling of being wrapped in her husband's embrace while they lay in bed, listening to the soothing patter of raindrops. On her way to the car, Gloria couldn't help but notice the beautiful blue wildflowers sprouting from the lawn. Their resilience in the face of winter's adversity struck her, reminding her of the innate desire for renewal and new beginnings that spring always brings. Humming along to the tunes playing on the car radio, Gloria made her way to the quaint coffee shop where she was meeting Zara, a dear friend she hadn't seen in a while. Zara had a son the same age as Vanessa, Gloria's daughter, and their friendship had blossomed years ago at a school function. 
Since then, they had remained close friends, sharing in each other's joys and challenges. Zara had arrived before Gloria, snagging a cozy table in the corner by the window. Their eyes met through the glass, exchanging waves and smiles as Gloria made her way inside. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee filled the bustling cafe as Gloria joined the line of customers eagerly awaiting their own cup of Colombian bliss. When Zara spotted Gloria approaching, she stood up with a grin. Hi, they both exclaimed, sharing a warm hug before settling into their seats. It's been too long, Gloria remarked. How have you been? Zara's eyes sparkled with enthusiasm as she shared updates with her friend. They reminisced about old times, laughing at memories from school functions they had attended together. They exchanged stories about their children, marveling at how quickly time flew by. As they delved deeper into conversation, Zara leaned in closer, lowering her voice. Gloria, she whispered, can you keep a secret? Of course, Gloria replied, miming the act of locking her lips and tossing away the key. What's going on? I probably shouldn't even be telling you this, Zara confessed, her excitement evident, but I've been, well, kind of seeing this guy. Gloria's coffee halted midway to her lips as she fixed her friend with a startled gaze. Wait, aren't you saying you're considering having an affair? Zara's lips curved into a mischievous half-smile. Well, we haven't crossed any lines yet, but I'm seriously thinking about it. It's Eric. He's just different, you know? Being with him makes me feel alive, but I'm worried he might lose interest if I don't take it to the next level. So, wait a minute, interrupted Gloria, her voice tinged with concern. Have you thought about the consequences? Are you willing to risk your marriage for him? Zara shrugged, a hint of nonchalance in her tone. Oh, I'm not talking about leaving Nick or anything. It's just a little excitement on the side, like they say, the spice of life, she remarked with a smile. And don't worry, I'd make sure Nick never found out. He'd be devastated if he knew. Besides, Eric's married too. We'd have to be discreet. Gloria felt a surge of anxiety gnawing at her, torn between her loyalty to her friend and her own moral compass. After two years of bearing her own secret, she decided to take a leap of faith and confide in Zara. Zara, do you remember a couple of years ago when Darren and I hit a rough patch? He actually left me for a little while, remember? Yeah, I do, but you never really opened up about it. I didn't want to pry, Zara replied. I never told anyone, and you have to swear not to breathe a word of what I'm about to tell you to another living soul, Gloria said, her tone grave. Zara nodded solemnly. Of course, Gloria, I promise. If this ever got out, it could ruin my marriage. That's why I've kept it buried. But, well, you need to hear it before you make any decisions that could jeopardize your own marriage. Gloria paused as the waitress topped off their coffee cups, then continued, her voice low and urgent. I'm probably no different from most other married women out there. After 12 years of marriage, I started feeling, I don't know, bored. Everything was becoming routine. It was like, after all those years, I looked around and realized, what am I doing? Where am I going? Nowhere. I felt stuck, like I had no real life of my own. Exactly, Zara interjected, her eyes reflecting understanding. I know exactly how you feel, Zara. I think most women experience something similar. It's not that you don't love your husband. I adore Darren with all my heart. But suddenly, it's like something's missing. I started feeling like I was slipping into a slight depression. Nothing felt exciting anymore, not even sex. And it wasn't anyone's fault. Darren was doing everything he could for me, especially in the bedroom. I should have been over the moon, but nothing seemed to lift my spirits, not even school functions. Gloria took a moment to sip her coffee, gauging Zara's reaction. Seeing her friend's attentive expression, she continued. And then I met Louis. Hugh, you had an affair, Zara asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Gloria nodded solemnly. An emotional affair, yes. Thankfully, I came to my senses before it turned physical. Thank goodness, she added with a heavy sigh. I was at that little grocery store on Marshall Avenue one day, and there he was. Oh, Zara, he was absolutely stunning. With his rugged good looks, sandy blonde hair, and those mesmerizing blue eyes that sparkled like Robert Redford's. And tall too, 
I'm certain he was well over six feet. Even with his clothes on, I could tell he had a nice build. I couldn't tear my eyes away from him, until he caught me, of course. I felt myself blushing as he smiled back at me. We began flirting, and it was thrilling, almost forbidden. But eventually, I snapped out of it. I needed to focus on my shopping, so I made my way to the produce aisle. As I reached for some tomatoes, I accidentally bumped into him. He looked at me with those captivating blue eyes and that charming smile and greeted me. Zara, I hate to admit it, but I could feel myself getting aroused. It was so embarrassing. I prayed he couldn't sense the scent I was giving off. I must have been blushing profusely. He extended his hand to shake mine and introduced himself. Despite noticing my wedding rings, he didn't seem deterred from trying to pursue me. It was quite flattering to think that a man like him could be interested in me. We chatted and laughed as we navigated the aisles, picking up our groceries. And as we reached the checkout, he boldly gave me his number and suggested we meet for lunch the following week. Zara hung on every word of Gloria's story, finding it eerily familiar. I almost tossed his card away as I was leaving the store. I thought, yeah, right. I'm going to call you and we're going to have this intensely hot, romantic love affair. And then my husband will kill us both. I didn't though. Didn't what? Zara asked, her curiosity piqued. I didn't throw his card away. I stuck it in my purse. Shit, all the way home. All I could think about was Louis. Darren came home as I was putting the groceries away. I already felt so guilty I snapped at him when he tried to help. I think it was some kind of unconscious defense mechanism. Poor Darren just asked if there was something wrong. Oh my god, what do you say? I lied, of course. I told him I was just a little tired from shopping. Truth was, I was secretly walking on cloud nine. Anyway, Gloria continued, I knew I shouldn't call him, it was wrong. I also knew that because of the way I was feeling, I was very vulnerable. I kept telling myself, no, no, no but I just couldn't help myself. I found one of the last payphones in the city and dialed the number on the card he gave me. We arranged to have lunch the following day. With bated breath, Zara waited for Gloria to take another sip of coffee before continuing. Zara, as we were heading to the restaurant, my emotions were in turmoil. I felt a mix of terror, excitement, and intense desire. At one point during our conversation, Louis reached across the table and clasped my hand. I was overwhelmed with the urge to be intimate with him, but a nagging sense of guilt or perhaps pure fear held me back. Regardless, I just couldn't bring myself to act on it. But Louis wasn't deterred. He had already begun his seductive tactics, subtly undermining Darren and painting him as unworthy of me. Foolishly, I fell for it, finding myself resenting my own husband before I knew it. Louis had skillfully manipulated me into believing Darren didn't appreciate me. Gosh, Gloria, your situation sounds so much like mine, Zara remarked. That's exactly why I'm sharing this with you, Zara. I want you to understand what you might be getting yourself into. Your guy, has he started mentioning Nick yet? No, not really, Zara replied, pausing to reconsider. Well, I mean, he's asked a few questions. Like, does your husband realize how fortunate he is? Stuff like that. I see, Gloria nodded knowingly, and naturally, you're beginning to ponder that yourself, aren't you? Well, Zara, it's surprising how things can slip by unnoticed. When Darren left me, he mentioned that I'd been short with him for over two months. I hadn't even realized it. The same went for our intimacy. I couldn't muster up any passion with someone who I felt was taking me for granted. As Gloria recounted her experience, she could see realization dawning in Zara's eyes. Consider it, Zara. What kind of man engages in an affair with a married woman? Can you picture Nick doing something like that? Nick? No, never. He wouldn't do that, Zara replied firmly. Exactly. So why jeopardize your marriage for someone who would? Gloria posed the question pointedly. While Zara contemplated Gloria's words, Gloria continued her narrative. Anyway, we met for lunch again the following week, and with each meeting, it became increasingly difficult to remain faithful to Darren. By our third lunch, he almost persuaded me to accompany him back to his apartment. I could sense his frustration with my excuses, and I knew that if we met for lunch one more time, we'd end up in bed together. 
As we exited the restaurant following our third lunch date, I casually mentioned that I needed to shop for a new dress because Darren had planned a special outing for our anniversary. I mentioned that we might revisit a dance club we used to frequent, reminiscing about the fun times we had there. Louis saw an opening and immediately seized it. He declared his intention to join us at the club, insisting he'd dance with me. I warned him against it, reminding him it was our anniversary and dancing with someone else might upset my husband. But Louis, in his arrogance, brushed off my concerns, claiming it would teach Darren a lesson. He wanted to demonstrate to Darren that other men desired me, hoping it would make Darren appreciate me more. Oh dear, Gloria, he didn't actually show up, did he? Zar asked, aghast. Gloria took a sip of her coffee before replying. He certainly did. I spotted him as soon as we entered the club. Naturally, I didn't acknowledge him. Darren and I were enjoying ourselves until Louis approached and asked me to dance. Oh my goodness, Zara whispered, shocked. Yep, and to top it off, he completely disregarded Darren, even acting rudely towards him. Naturally, Darren was offended and gave me an ultimatum, saying I couldn't dance with Louis. You know how stubborn I can be sometimes. I got upset and insisted I would dance with him anyway. Darren warned me he wouldn't be there when we finished dancing, but who takes such threats seriously, right? Zara observed Gloria's eyes brimming with emotion as she continued. As we hit the dance floor, I confronted Louis about his behavior towards Darren. I asked him why he had to be so disrespectful, to which he replied that he wanted to put Darren in his place. That just fueled my anger. Of course, Louis kept me close while we danced, but at that point, my main concern was whether Darren was watching and getting even angrier. I was so preoccupied that I didn't even notice when the first dance ended and we started the second. When the music stopped, I told Louis not to ask for any more dances. I declared that I was going to spend the rest of the evening with my husband. As I headed back to our table, I saw Louis trailing behind me. I demanded to know what he thought he was doing, and he said he wanted to apologize to Darren. When we returned to the table, Darren was nowhere to be seen. Louis took a seat and casually mentioned he'd wait with me until Darren returned. I had a sinking feeling that he had no intention of apologizing. Rather, I suspected he wanted to continue stirring up trouble between Darren and me. Why would he do that? Zara inquired, puzzled. What would he gain from it? I mulled it over, and my best guess is that since he hadn't succeeded in seducing me yet, he thought he'd try to create discord between Darren and me instead. I imagine he hoped I'd turn to him for comfort, with the expectation that he'd end up consoling me in bed before the night was over. I assumed Darren had gone to the restroom. I urged Louis to return to his own table, but he kept dragging his feet. When the waitress approached, he took the opportunity to order us drinks. It was then that she asked if we wanted to open another tab. I was dumbfounded. Darren had settled the bill before leaving. Zara, I felt like I was watching my entire married life flash before my eyes. I couldn't believe he had just abandoned me like that. Gloria's distress was palpable as she recounted her story, and Zara couldn't help but feel the weight of her friend's pain. Emotions stirred within Zara, and soon, a solitary tear escaped her eye, tracing a path down her cheek. You shouldn't have to tell me all of this, Gloria, Zara said, her voice thick with empathy. You're upset. Maybe we should stop here. No, I need to tell you everything, Zara, Gloria insisted, her determination evident. You need to understand the whole picture. It's important, she paused, collecting herself. So, where was I? Right, I immediately reached for my phone and called Darren, asking him to come back and pick me up. That's when he dropped the bombshell. He thought I was having an affair, and he suspected it was with Louis. He said he was going to pack a bag and leave, unsure if he'd return. Gloria reached for a napkin, wiping away the tears that had gathered in her eyes. It hit me like a ton of bricks, Zara, she continued. It was like a sudden revelation, everything becoming clear. It wasn't Darren who was taking me for granted. He had done everything he could to support me. It was me. I was the one taking him, Vanessa, and our life together for granted. I realized I was risking my entire marriage for some jerk. I begged Darren to come back so we could talk, but
but he refused, so I called a cab. What was Louis up to during all of this? Sara inquired. Oh, he wasn't giving up, not yet. He insisted that Darren didn't deserve me and urged me to go home with him instead. I promptly shut him down, she recounted with a chuckle. But even after that, he persisted. He followed me outside and tried to make a move as the cab pulled up. I didn't hesitate to give him a knee to the groin. Bent over in pain, I made it clear that any further attempts to contact me would result in a sexual harassment lawsuit. Zara reached out and grasped her friend's hand as Gloria wiped away more tears. By the time I got home, Darren was nowhere to be found. I tried calling him, but his phone was off. Zara, I was terrified. I could see my marriage falling apart right in front of me. Everything we had built, our whole family, seemed to be on the verge of crumbling. I've never been so scared in my life. The following day, I attempted to reach him at his workplace, but he refused to speak with me. His secretary informed me that he had instructed the receptionist to prevent me from seeing him if I showed up. Feeling desperate, I sought out Andrea, my neighbor, as Darren had a good rapport with her and her husband. I hoped she might be able to convince him to talk to me. Surprisingly, he did speak to her, but only to express that he needed time to think and promise to contact me in a couple of weeks. Recognizing that pressuring him would be counterproductive, I decided to give him the space he requested. Those two weeks were excruciating. Whenever Vanessa was present, I forced myself to appear strong and told her that daddy was away, but in private, I couldn't help but cry. I feared I had irreparably damaged our relationship. Darren was so angry, I doubted he would ever return, especially if he believed I had been unfaithful. Gloria paused, her voice choked with emotion. I'm sorry, she said to Zara, wiping away tears. It's still difficult to talk about, even after all this time. Taking a deep breath, she continued her story. As I was saying, Darren finally called and said he was coming home. Zara, I was on the brink of losing everything, and let me tell you, it made me realize the value of what I had and how incredibly fortunate I was. Ultimately, Zara, love must prevail over desire. I love Darren, and he loves me. In my eyes, there's no man in this world worth jeopardizing that for. Wow, Zara responded thoughtfully, you're absolutely right. I can't imagine what I would do if my husband left me. Did you ever confess the truth to Darren? Are you kidding? After coming so close to losing him, I couldn't risk it happening again. Zara, I live in constant fear that one day he'll uncover the truth, but since the day he returned home, I've strived to be the best wife I can be. I no longer take him or our marriage for granted. Every day, I thank my lucky stars for what I have and I express my gratitude to Darren with all the passion in my heart. All I can hope for is that it's enough if he ever does discover the truth. Zara squeezed Gloria's hand reassuringly. I'm so grateful you shared your story with me, Gloria. You've prevented me from making a huge mistake. Thank you. The two girls conversed for a brief while longer, then tentatively arranged their next meeting before bidding each other goodbye. Gloria felt a sense of satisfaction, knowing she had just steered her friend away from a disastrous choice. She arrived home in time to greet her daughter with a kiss and a snack after school. Vanessa is growing up so quickly, she mused to herself. She'll be ten soon. Where does the time fly? When Darren returned from work, Gloria welcomed her husband with warm embraces and kisses. She had never broached the subject of their challenging marital period until that day. Talking to Zora served as a poignant reminder of the wonderful life she and Darren had built together. Later that night, with Darren peacefully asleep beside her, Gloria shifted onto her side and propped herself up on her elbow. She studied the lines on his face, each a testament to the passage of time and the memories they held. With a delicate touch, she traced a few of the newer lines, her heart swelling with affection and admiration for the man lying beside her. Gently, Gloria pressed her lips against his, but as their kiss deepened, Darren's lips curved into a wide grin. He enveloped his beloved wife in a tight embrace, returning her affection with a fervent kiss. I thought you were asleep, Gloria whispered. Actually, I was lying here thinking about what to get Vanessa for her birthday, he replied. You know what she really needs. What? Gloria inquired. A baby brother or sister, 
Darren announced. Although not entirely unexpected, the suggestion of expanding their family brought a smile to Gloria's face. It seemed her husband had just settled the debate for them. Well, her birthday is only two months away. Honey, shouldn't we get started? Gloria teased. Darren's smile widened. You read my mind. Two months later, Vanessa celebrated her 10th birthday with a grand party in the backyard. Mom and Dad invited all her friends, ensuring there was an abundance of ice cream and cake for everyone. After the festivities, Gloria and Darren surprised their daughter with yet another lavish gift, and the joyful news of a forthcoming baby brother. The Second Story Despite my lingering suspicions, my love for her remained steadfast. Strange occurrences, unprecedented in our 15 years of marriage, set off alarm bells in my mind. Her style transformed drastically when the new boss assumed control at her office. Suddenly, our domestic life took a turn for the better. She initiated intimacy, a departure from her past behavior. Nighttime texts became routine, as did late meetings after work. Though she offered plausible explanations for each occurrence, my innate jealousy simmered beneath the surface. I instructed the private investigation firm to withhold any findings until their investigation concluded. I hoped against hope that my concerns were merely the product of an overactive imagination. Three months later, I received a comprehensive dossier that shattered my illusions. Video footage, audio recordings, and photographs confirmed my worst fears. Without hesitation, I instructed Grant, my attorney, to initiate divorce proceedings, demanding the papers be prepared by Wednesday afternoon. Unbeknownst to her, I plotted to confront them during their Thursday night tryst, a surprise in store for the illicit couple. Her audacity astounded me. Polly, of all people, should have known better. She knows me intimately, my intuition, my determination, my unforgiving nature. She witnessed firsthand my ruthlessness in business, how I rose to power and decimated my competitors. Now I command a significant stake in a major trucking company, earning the respect of drivers and teamsters alike through fair treatment. I've lavished Polly with everything, treating her like royalty, a fact she proudly shares with friends and family. Yet, despite her adoration, she jeopardized it all for a fleeting affair. Why? This question haunts me relentlessly, even in these final hours. Why would she throw away everything we built together? Why? It remains my most haunting inquiry. Polly's actions were baffling, given her role as a dedicated mother and wife, juggling household duties and a full-time job as an executive assistant at a local tech company. She seemed to have it all together. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine she would stray. I'm Henry Cooper, Polly's husband of 15 years, and the father of our two preteen daughters who adore their daddy. I fit the archetype of an alpha male, unyielding in demeanor but cherishing my wife as the prize she truly is. Though I possess my father's imposing stature, standing at 6 feet 6 inches and weighing 265 pounds of muscle, I am a gentle giant until provoked. Polly witnessed my protective instincts in action on a couple of occasions when we were out together and she attracted unwanted attention. With her long legs, slim waist, and angelic face, she naturally draws admiring glances, fueling my simmering jealousy, a flaw I struggle to rein in. Twice in our 15 years together, my jealousy erupted into action. When aggressive men disregarded Polly's refusal and attempted to pull her onto the dance floor, they underestimated my resolve. In those moments, I unleashed my strength, dislocating one man's shoulder and inflicting a concussion on another. I refuse to tolerate disrespect, but my wife knows firsthand the lengths I will go to protect her. Given Polly's familiarity with my protective nature, her decision to engage in an affair raises perplexing questions. Why would she risk everything we've built together, knowing the depths of my loyalty and the extent of my devotion to her? It's a puzzle that continues to haunt me. Date night, Thursday. Every detail was meticulously arranged. Accompanied by one of my fixers, I arrived early at the designated location, ensuring a private setting. Generously tipping the hostess ensured they would be seated away from prying eyes. My brilliant wife believed I was out of town, unaware of the trap I was laying. The audio recordings revealed her willingness to rendezvous with her boss on Thursday night.
Despite my seething anger, I listened as he eagerly made plans, oblivious to the impending storm. Equipped with software from the PI agency, I monitored Polly's communications, capturing every damning exchange. Each message fueled my fury, particularly his audacious request to pick her up from our home. My plan was simple, confront them mid traced delivering a performance that would culminate in a stern warning and the shock of divorce papers. Revenge burned within me, drowning out any sympathy for the pain I knew my actions would inflict. Despite my conviction, a nagging doubt lingered. Deep down, I knew Polly loved me and her children. Yet, the desire for retribution eclipsed any semblance of compassion. Some may argue for forgiveness, citing our years together and the triviality of a mere affair. But as an immature, jealous alpha male, I refused to let another man defile my wife and maintain his grip on her affections. Though my love for her remained, the betrayal irreparably tainted our connection. With eyes and backup strategically positioned, I awaited the signal indicating the opportune moment. Thursday night arrived, and upon receiving confirmation that the couple had been seated and served, I prepared to confront them. Exiting my car, I entered the restaurant, exchanging pleasantries with the hostess before mustering the composure to execute my plan. As I surveyed the scene, my heart constricted at the sight of the couple, a pang of betrayal mingled with resentment as I beheld my wife, resplendent in a cocktail dress that accentuated her flawless figure, a sight she never bestowed upon me. The inexplicable act fueled my simmering fury, intensifying my determination to unravel the truth. Stealing myself, I approached from the side, their obliviousness fueling my resolve. Polly and her companion remained engrossed in each other, their intimacy a stark contrast to the impending confrontation. With calculated precision, I positioned myself at their table, unnoticed until I pulled a chair from a nearby table, eliciting a reaction that ranged from shock to guilt upon Polly's face. Addressing her with forced joviality, I feigned ignorance of the situation. Polly's attempt to maintain composure, coupled with her introduction of me to her unsuspecting date, only fueled my disdain. The facade of normalcy shattered as the confrontation commenced. She was a master of deception, I had to give her that. Smooth and quick on her feet, she effortlessly veiled her deceit. As my ordered drink arrived, I brushed off Polly's fabrications and raised my glass in a calculated toast. Let's raise our glasses, I declared with a congenial smile, diverting attention from her attempted subterfuge. Here's to an intriguing evening and a new chapter. Turning to her boss, Jasper, I engaged him in conversation, feigning ignorance of Polly's transgressions. Jasper, do you know the secret to Polly and my 15 years of blissful marriage? It's built on a foundation of honesty and trust. Are you married, Jasper? I queried already armed with knowledge gleaned from the report. Yes, happily married for 20 years with four wonderful children, Jasper replied, echoing my sentiments on the importance of trust and honesty in marriage. Marvelous to hear, Jasper, I remarked, turning the spotlight back to Polly. And Polly, would you say you share the same sentiments? Yes, darling, trust and honesty are paramount in our relationship, Polly affirmed confidently, her demeanor betraying no hint of guilt or apprehension. You see, Jasper, our marriage thrives on mutual trust. I continued, watching their discomfort with a calculated sip from my glass. As long as Polly remains faithful, she knows she has my unwavering love and support. With each carefully chosen word, I tightened the noose of my game, intent on unraveling their fixate. So, how long have you two been dating? I inquired nonchalantly, a grin plastered across my face. Polly's irritation flared as she attempted to regain control, her tone indignant. Honey, this is strictly a business meeting, she retorted, casting me a reproachful glance. Please refrain from embarrassing me in front of my boss with your baseless jealousy. You know me better than that. Seizing the opportunity, her date chimed in, eager to assert his innocence. Indeed, Henry, this is purely business, he interjected, adopting a conciliatory tone. I needed to discuss some upcoming changes with Polly. I apologize if there's been any misunderstanding, but rest assured, my intentions are purely professional. Feigning contrition, I offered a sheepish apology. 
I'm sorry for any misunderstanding, I muttered, adopting a chastened demeanor. So, this is just a business dinner, then. No romantic entanglements. That's correct, Henry, Polly affirmed with forced conviction. Just business meetings, nothing more. Please stop this childish behavior. Bowing my head in false submission, I continued to play my part. I'm sorry, I murmured, struggling to contain my simmering resentment. Seeing you in that alluring dress, accompanied by this charming man, well, you can understand why I might feel a tad insecure. Jasper's reassurance only served to fuel my resolve. Henry, there's no need to apologize, he offered, patting me on the back. If my wife were in your shoes, I'd likely feel the same. As tension dissipated, I signaled to the man observing from the bar. With a thick folder in hand, he approached the table, delivering the damning evidence. As I laid out the incriminating photos, I turned to Polly, my voice heavy with sorrow. Polly, I loved you with all my heart, I whispered, my words laced with pain, but you shattered our marriage with your betrayal. I'll never forget the things I saw and heard. Thank you for destroying everything we had. Polly's gasp echoed through the tense silence as her hands flew to cover her mouth. Jasper, visibly enraged, demanded to know the source of the incriminating photos, but I silenced him with a curt command. As I laid out the damning evidence, I took a moment to scrutinize each photo, punctuating the air with pointed remarks. Polly's tears flowed freely now, her pleas for mercy falling on deaf ears as I endeavored to keep our confrontation discreet, mindful of the prying eyes of neighboring tables. Realizing the gravity of her predicament, Polly grasped for a lifeline. I'm sorry, baby, she implored, desperation tainting her voice. Let's leave and talk about this. It's not what it seems, I promise. I regarded her with a sardonic smirk, deliberately drawing out my response. Not what it seems? I echoed slowly, my tone laced with disbelief. Are you truly prepared to continue this charade? Know this, both of you. I possess hours of incontrovertible evidence, videos, audio recordings, texts, emails, and more. And Polly, after witnessing those videos, I never imagined you capable of such deceit. You hid that side of yourself well. But rest assured, I understand everything now. Gesturing to my associate, I directed him to explain our purpose. With a solemn nod, I presented Polly with the divorce papers, my voice heavy with finality. Polly, our marriage is over. I declared, my words a cold indictment. You and your lover have irreparably damaged my love for you. Tonight, you'll sign these papers, witnessed by our notary friend at the bar. Refuse and I'll expose every sordid detail to your parents, friends, and worst of all, our children. I've been fair in this divorce, but our daughters will live with me. They deserve better than a cheater for a mother. Jasper, my friend, I began, my voice cool and determined, I suggest you persuade your girlfriend here to sign these papers before I leave. Otherwise, I'll be delivering copies of all the evidence to your wife and your executive team at work. Once I'm done, you'll be out of a job, and Regina will ensure you're ruined financially for a very long time. I'd rather not go down that road, so convince her to sign the divorce papers, and then my soon-to-be ex-wife is all yours. I want nothing to do with that cheating woman ever again. The weight of my words hung heavy in the air, slicing through Polly's defenses. The prospect of losing custody of her daughters added another layer of desperation to her tear-streaked face, while her boyfriend's panic was palpable. Polly's pleas for forgiveness echoed with familiar desperation, empty promises to make amends, explanations, and declarations of love. But I remained unmoved, steeling myself against her emotional onslaught. Dismissing her entreaties, I rose from my seat with finality. I'll be heading to the men's room, I announced firmly. When I return, those papers had better be signed. If not, prepare yourselves for a level of hell you can't even imagine. Left alone with her lover, Polly's sobs intensified, her desperation mounting as she grasped for a lifeline. Jasper, sensing the gravity of the situation, acted swiftly. Polly, just sign them, he urged urgently but ask him to hold on to them for a week. Use that time to convince him you love him, that you'll do anything to salvage your marriage. Promise therapy, whatever it takes, but make him wait a week. It's the only chance we have. He's serious, and if he has those videos and audios, we're both finished. 
I don't want a divorce, Polly cried, her voice choked with emotion. Trust me, if you can get him to wait, I'm sure you can save your marriage. Think about the children. You don't want to lose the girls, do you? I implored, knowing the gravity of the situation. Her tears flowed anew, and after a few agonizing minutes, I returned to the table. Well, have you signed them yet? I asked, my tongue clipped. With a heavy heart, she met my gaze and spoke in a voice laden with sorrow. Honey, I'll do whatever you want, including signing these papers. But please can you give me just one week? One week to be with my girls and talk. After fifteen years, please give me that much. I sat in silence, contemplating her plea. Despite the betrayal, I relented. Even though you deserve nothing from me after what you've done, I'll give you that, I conceded begrudgingly. You can come home, but you'll stay in one of the guest bedrooms. I don't want you near my bed during this time. Now sign them so I can leave. As she signed the papers, I gathered them into the folder and stood to depart. Before leaving, I took her hand in mine, watching as she smiled until I removed her wedding rings, dropping mine into her wine glass. Her crestfallen expression brought a small measure of satisfaction, a fleeting acknowledgement of the pain she'd inflicted. Turning to Jasper, I delivered a final warning. Well, asshole, she's your date now. Do what you want with her, I spat, seething with contempt. But remember, you slept with my wife, destroyed our marriage, and endangered a lot, including my children's love for their mother. Your ass is mine, and I have your balls in my hand. Don't cross me. You're lucky I didn't carry out my original plans for you. It's far from over between us, you scumbag. You'll be hearing from me soon. Got it. Jasper nodded silently as I loomed over him, a silent testament to the disruption of their evening plans. As I made to depart, Polly seized my arm, her voice pleading. Henry, can I please come home with you? I just want to be with you. Please. I recoiled from her touch as if scorched by fire, my disgust palpable. I have no desire to be seen with a traitor like you, I retorted, my disdain evident. You disgust me. I'm ashamed to have been your husband. Admittedly, I was far from gracious in that moment, but frankly, I didn't care. Despite the tumult of emotions within me, I took pride in my ability to contain my jealousy and anger. I had given her a week to ponder her actions. Now it was time to see what would unfold. The following morning, I heard her return home late in the evening quietly retreating to the guest suite, a tacit acknowledgement of the strained atmosphere between us. The next morning, as we crossed paths in the kitchen, I remained resolute in my determination for retribution. Good morning, cheater, I greeted her coldly, my tone dripping with contempt. How is my cheating wife today? She flinched, her gaze dropping to her coffee cup as she uttered the familiar refrain of every cheating spouse caught in the act. Honey, we need to talk. Listen, there's nothing to discuss, Polly, I interjected, cutting off her attempt at reconciliation. I know everything. I know the extent of your betrayal, the duration of your affair, the disparaging remarks you made about me and our marriage. I witnessed the things you did with him, the way you dressed for him. I heard all the comparisons, all the lies, all the deceit. You took me for a fool, and I can't fathom how foolish you were to believe you could get away with it. Unless there's something I've overlooked, there's nothing left to say. I'm the fool, not you, Polly confessed, tears streaming down her cheeks. I don't know why I let it happen. You gave me everything I ever wanted, and I love you regardless of what you heard in those videos. You have to know I never meant to hurt you, and I never wanted you to find out. Exactly my point, Polly, I responded, my voice heavy with disappointment. You never wanted me to find out. You wanted to keep it a secret, to continue lying and sleeping with your lover behind my back. That's the crux of the matter, Polly. I can forgive infidelity. After all, we're all human and make mistakes. But this wasn't a mistake. You chose this, and you chose to keep it a secret, to lie, cheat, and conceal your affair. I love you, Polly, but as Tina Turner says, what's love got to do with it? My trust is shattered, and I'm left wondering if I ever truly knew you. How many other men have there been? How many times have you returned to my bed after being with your lover? I'm so disgusted, I can barely find the words.
Sobbing now, Polly realized the depth of my pain and the gravity of her actions. There were no more excuses or justifications, only an admission of guilt. Okay, I'm guilty, and I hate myself for it, she admitted, her voice choked with remorse. There was never anyone else, and no matter what I say, I know you won't be able to forgive me for what I've done. But I don't want a divorce. I'll do whatever it takes to stay with you. I think I need counseling, and maybe we can go together to figure out what's wrong with me. Please, don't leave me. I paused for a moment, considering her plea. Polly, you can go to counseling, do whatever you need to do, and I'll support you, I replied finally. But I can't live with a woman who could discard me so callously. Your actions and the words you said revealed your true feelings, and I can't see a way forward with someone who feels that way about me. I know there are other women out there who would cherish the chance to be with me. You had your opportunity, and you chose to throw it away. Enjoy your week here with the girls. Try to explain why you're leaving. I won't speak ill of you, but it's important that you tell them you're leaving and why, I stated firmly. In the divorce agreement, I've granted you full access to our daughters at all times, but they will be living with me. However, if you continue to engage in promiscuous behavior and set a negative example for our daughters, I will have to reconsider the terms of your visitations. I'll treat you better than you deserve and help you maintain your relationship with our daughters, but I have two questions for you to consider before you answer. Firstly, why I? Why did you risk everything for this? And secondly, was it worth it? The following Monday, I contacted Jasper and arranged to meet him for lunch on Wednesday. After convincing him of the importance of our meeting, I expressed my profound disappointment in how he had contributed to the destruction of my marriage and hinted at the potential consequences. Over lunch, I outlined the repercussions of his actions and detailed my expectations for restitution. You're going to pay for Polly's rent and car payments for the next three years, I declared firmly. Consider it your punishment. You're getting off easy, Jasper. Despite everything, I still care for my cheating wife and want her to be taken care of. Since you played a role in this, you'll comply with my demands. This arrangement will help Polly get back on her feet after I kick her out. If you fail to follow through, I'll ensure you lose your job and that Regina learns about your infidelity. Consider it a lifeline, Jasper. This is the consequence of seducing a married woman. People like you need to understand that actions have repercussions. Why not pursue single women instead of tearing apart families? That was a cowardly move, Jasper. Epilogue Despite my anger and hurt, I made sure to treat Polly with decency, allowing her to visit the children and maintaining a cordial relationship. However, she never managed to regain my respect or trust. Jasper faithfully made his payments every month, knowing the consequences if he failed to comply. Polly struggled to provide satisfactory answers to my questions. While she expressed remorse for her actions and admitted they weren't worth it, she couldn't explain the underlying motivation. Now living alone, without a boyfriend and the love she once had, she faced the consequences of her choices. I could have inflicted more pain upon her, but the loss of her family and my love was punishment enough. Despite undergoing counseling, Polly couldn't offer a satisfactory explanation for her actions. Her best attempt was, I don't know why, it just happened. It had nothing to do with you or our marriage because I do love you and was happy with our life together, but it was something new and exciting. I screwed up. Unable to contain my frustration, I confronted her. If you were truly happy, why did you dress up and wear provocative clothing for him? Why engage in behaviors with him that you never did with me? It just happened isn't a sufficient answer. You repeatedly chose to pursue this affair and dress to entice him each time. Yet you claim to love me. Perhaps one day you'll have the courage to provide a genuine explanation. I believe you owe us that much. For those of us who have been cheated on, this remains an unsolvable riddle. Thanks to the actions of these two cheating couples, I'm uncertain if I can ever fully trust or commit myself to another woman again. It's a sad reality, but one that I must come to terms with. The Third Story Alex was engrossed in analyzing new test data, a tedious task that formed the core of his team's efforts on the test vehicle over the past month. Reluctantly, he delved into correlating and tabulating the information for further analysis. 
His concentration was interrupted by the chirping of his phone, indicating a new text message. Glancing at the screen, he noted the notification but paid no attention to the sender's name. Only after several minutes, during a momentary break in his work, did he glance up from his monitor. Curiosity peak, he reached for his phone and inspected the notification. The number wasn't saved in his contacts, and though the area code was local, it didn't ring a bell. Initially tempted to dismiss it as spam, he hesitated, considering the possibility that it might be from a teammate whose number he hadn't yet saved. He clicked on the text, and a message appeared on the screen. At first he was confused, who could have sent him this image? But there was an intimate photo on his phone. He read the message, look carefully, you still have time. Bradley, 6 p.m. He reread it again. He thought about it for a moment and chuckled slightly. It wasn't often they got the wrong number to send pictures like that. He was about to delete the message when he looked at the photo again, and his heart nearly stopped. One detail in the photograph struck him. There was a mole on the left leg of the girl in the picture. The tiny mole belonged to Candy, his wife, with whom he had lived for the past six years. He stared again, disbelieving, looking for anything that might disprove what he'd seen with his own eyes, but the closer he looked, the more convinced he became that it was his wife. Upon rereading the note, he realized it mentioned Bradley's, a local pub unfamiliar to him and Candy. It was situated in the neighboring town, but why would Candy be at Bradley's at 6 p.m. when she was en route to Boston? Her team was diligently preparing a crucial proposal, with the pitch scheduled for Monday afternoon. Today was the day the entire team flew in to finalize preparations, with a comprehensive dress rehearsal set for Sunday. As one of the principal figures, Candy's presence for preparation was a given. Checking the time, it was 5.15 p.m. Candy's flight was due to land in Boston at 4.30. Typically, she would call upon arrival, but it was reasonable to assume she was occupied with rounding up the team and their equipment, making their way to the hotel. He debated whether to call her but opted to respond to the text message first. His reply wasn't particularly inventive, but it was to be expected. Who is this? How did you obtain this photo? Am I expected to meet you at Bradley's? As he packed up for the day, he made a decision. He would go to Bradley's. He needed answers, and he was determined to get them one way or another. He sent a casual text to Candy. How was the flight? I'm heading out for a bite. Give a call when you're free. His aim was to maintain a relaxed demeanor while attempting to gather more information. As he strolled towards his car, anticipating a response from Candy, his phone chimed once more. Assuming it was Candy, he swiftly checked his phone, only to find it was a reply from the mysterious sender. I'll be there, but I'm sure you will find someone more interesting than me there. His mind began to race. Opening the Maps app on his phone, he quickened his pace towards his car. Bradley's was a 30-minute drive away, and it was already 5.40. He calculated that he would arrive shortly after 6 p.m. Uncertain of the significance of timing, he opted to head directly to Bradley's, hoping to be punctual for whoever the sender implied he would find interesting. During the ride, his phone chirped once more. This time, it was a message from Candy, crazy time with the team, call you later before bed. Love you. He didn't dwell on it, knowing they would catch up later. His focus was now on the impending meeting at Bradley's and unraveling how the sender acquired such intimate knowledge about his wife. His heart raced as he pulled into the parking lot at 6.12. The sender hadn't provided any clues about who he was supposed to meet, leading him to assume that the individual must know him and would initiate contact. However, it was the cryptic mention of someone more interesting being present that heightened his apprehension. The sender seemed privy to information he didn't possess, leaving him feeling like he was walking into a trap with no alternative method of uncovering the truth. It was a picture that turned him upside down inside. He trusted her completely, and their life together was perfect, at least he thought so. But there was only one way someone could have gotten a picture like that, and he was going to find out in about five minutes, and the thought of the finality of that answer horrified him. Entering the pub, Alex's eyes adjusted to the dimmer lighting. Unfamiliar with the establishment, he paused by the entrance, surveying the surroundings. 
A spacious dining area lay ahead, while a bar was situated to his left. Opting for the bar, he settled onto a stool at the end. The bartender, just finishing an order for a well-dressed patron, approached Alex to take his order. Requesting a draft, Alex glanced back towards the dining area. His attention was drawn to a man who had just taken his drink order and was now crossing the room towards a table filled with jovial individuals. It was then that he noticed what the mysterious texter had hinted at. Seated at the table, receiving a drink from the well-dressed man, was Candy, adorned in her little black dress and pearls, radiating confidence and charm. Acting on autopilot, Alex rose from his seat and made his way towards the table where Candy sat. As he approached, Candy's expression shifted from a warm smile to one of wide-eyed fear. Unperturbed, Alex continued his advance. When he reached the table, he seized a handful of the well-dressed man's hair with his left hand, yanking him forcefully backward. The man, losing his balance and spilling his drinks, stumbled backwards, emitting cries of pain. As Alex pulled him past, he released his grip and prepared to deliver a punch with his right hand, only to find the man tumbling out of reach, landing on the floor in a disheveled heap. Recognizing him, Alex issued a stern command, Don't get up, Ben. I mean it. Ben, previously well-dressed but now soaked in drink and crumpled on the floor, nodded silently, making no attempt to rise or speak. Alex glanced back at Candy, noting the sudden hush that had fallen over the table. Recognizing familiar faces among the group, all part of Candy's team, he couldn't help but muse. I guess team loyalty outweighs infidelity. Yet, amidst the silent crowd, he sensed one person who had chosen to divulge the truth to him. Briefly considering identifying this individual, he swiftly dismissed the notion as futile. I'm going home. If there's any hope of salvaging our marriage, you'll come with me now, he declared, his gaze fixed on Candy. She nodded in response, beginning to rise, but he raised his hand to forestall her. Give me a moment before you follow, he added before turning to leave. Before departing, he directed his attention to Leona Wilson, seated beside Vicky Thornton. Leona, does Zach believe you're in Boston too? Vicky, is Maria under the same impression? Their silence spoke volumes, unable to meet his gaze or answer his probing inquiry. The journey home passed in a blur, Alex finding himself in his driveway before fully registering his surroundings. Inside, he retrieved a beer from the fridge and settled into the living room. Zach Wilson and Maria Thornton were familiar names, but the other two couples were strangers to him. Reflecting on the evening's revelations, he debated reaching out to Vicky or Maria, but ultimately decided against it. Unsure of what to say and feeling a pang of betrayal from their apparent deceit, Instead, he opted to send them a brief text, subtly hinting at his awareness. Just heard from Candy that team travel plans seem to have changed. Might be worth giving her a call for an update. With that, he left them to choose whether to investigate further, satisfied that he had acted with honesty and integrity. About 20 minutes later, the sound of the garage door opening signaled Candy's return home. Alex remained seated in the living room, waiting her arrival. She entered, still clad in her little black dress but now without shoes or jewelry. Taking a seat across from him on the sofa, Candy appeared composed. Alex chose to maintain silence, recognizing its potency in fostering dialogue. He was determined to let the weight of the quiet linger until Candy was ready to speak. It didn't take long for Candy to break the silence. It's not what you think, she began, but Alex raised a hand, signaling for her to stop. You have no idea what I think about what happened tonight, Alex replied evenly. I'm not interested in a lengthy explanation. As engineers, we both understand that why questions often lack definitive answers. Instead, let's start with the basics. How long has this been going on? How many times? How frequently? Do our friends know, aside from those involved tonight? Am I known as your cuckold among our colleagues and friends? No, Alex, it's not like that at all, Candy interjected. The team's travel plans got disrupted, and Ben suggested we stay in town for a down day before resuming our work. I didn't see the whole team there, or was everyone else? Alex inquired. When we received the update, some of the team decided to stay home for another night and join us at the airport tomorrow, Candy confessed. 
But you chose to deceive me, he asserted. You seemed rather cozy with Ben. Is there anything going on between the star engineer and the Wonderkind program manager that you'd like to disclose? Well, for starters, Ben managed to persuade the owners at Bradley's not to press charges, she replied, her tone upbeat. His eyes widened in disbelief at her sense of loyalty. I couldn't care less about your friend. If he hadn't tripped over himself, I might have rearranged his nose. The jury's still out on that, by the way, Alex retorted, a half-smile creeping onto his face. Let him press charges. I've spent a night in jail before. It doesn't faze me. Besides, it might make for interesting testimony, he added, his tone laced with irony. Do you love him? Candy fell silent for a moment, gathering her thoughts. The weight of the silence hung heavy in the air, as Alex's mind raced to fill the void. It was evident that this conversation was far from reaching a resolution. He's not my friend. There's absolutely nothing between us. Yes, I should have informed you about the change in travel plans, but it seemed insignificant whether I was in town or in Boston. You weren't expecting me, and I was still committed to the team. We were simply grabbing a meal before retiring to our rooms. There was no justification for your behavior. He was merely fetching drinks. You embarrassed me in front of my team, she exclaimed, her tone shifting to one of defiance as she attempted to deflect and assert control. He retrieved his phone and pulled up the incriminating text, sliding it across the coffee table to her. The expression on her face betrayed recognition. She knew there was no way to deny it. As she began to speak again, her tone lacked the earlier bluster. Alex swiftly started a voice recording app on his phone, tucking it into his shirt pocket to capture the conversation. Alex, our team is, she hesitated, searching for the right words. Very close-knit in many ways. Most of us. She trailed off, struggling to articulate her explanation. We have a small group that meets regularly. They were all at Bradley's. We were the ones shouldering the bulk of the work for the proposal. You know how much time I've been devoting to preparing our pitch. I'm not exactly sure how it all started. It was sometime after Ben took over as PM. We worked closely together, and I was drawn to him, and things just evolved, Candy confessed. No lies, he interjected firmly. Cheating doesn't simply happen. Clothes don't just come off. There are conscious decisions involved, and we both know that. So please, don't insult my intelligence. So, it's been nearly six months, he mused, answering one of his own questions. Around the time Ben joined the team, right? She nodded in confirmation. The team, he began again, pausing to find the right words. You all, he let the sentence trail off, leaving the implication hanging in the air. She nodded once more. And Ben suggested this was beneficial for fostering trust and team dynamics. Is that how he convinced all of you to engage in this, consortium? He questioned pointedly. Now you're being crude. It's more than that. I feel a deep connection to Ben and the team, more than ever before, Candy retorted, her bravado resurfacing. Alex couldn't shake the feeling that this conversation was headed for a turbulent conclusion. Unfortunately, there might be some changes coming to your team, Alex disclosed. What have you done? Candy gasped. Alex, involving anyone else will only cause more harm. Let them deal with their own choices. We need to focus on us. Candy, you must understand that I can't remain silent and be complicit. I care about Vicky and Maria. Frankly, I feel more favorable towards them than I do towards Leona and Zach right now, he explained. I messaged them about the altered travel plans. How your friends respond to their spouses, and how their spouses handle those responses, is entirely their concern. I can live with my decision. Alex, we have the most productive team in the history of Cromerica Incorporated, she was almost yelling at me. And you've been profitable too, mister. Just because we had team planning meetings on Wednesdays, doesn't mean you missed out on everything. I never denied you access to me when you needed it. So I slept with my team a little earlier, you never knew. And that picture you showed me, do you want to know about that? Now she was mocking me. It was right after Ben and I slept together. And yes, Liana was there too. If you don't know about it, then it didn't happen, right? I froze in place, listening to the extent of the deception and the depths of my ignorance.
Some now just because you're aware, just because your fragile ego is bruised, you're willing to throw away everything my team and I have achieved. Candy hissed, her anger escalating with each word. Her fury was contagious. Alex felt his heart racing as Candy passionately defended her team's questionable dynamic, fueling his own growing resentment. For a brief moment during his drive home from Bradley's, he entertained the idea that perhaps he could forgive a one-time transgression with Ben. But that thought had been swiftly extinguished in a bloody demise. He didn't need to hear any more. He didn't want to hear any more. Yet, Candy persisted. No, we won't let you off the hook that easily. You're going to text Vicky and Maria and tell them that you heard from me and we were stuck in Atlanta but have arrangements for the morning. That's the story Leona and Zach will stick to and you're going to support it, damn it. She shouted. There's millions at stake in this deal and your grievances mean nothing. Send the text and then we can discuss how to proceed. How to proceed? Alex countered, his own voice rising in anger. There's no proceeding from this. You're leaving. Now, you and your twisted team and your ringleader Ben can carry on however you please. We're finished. I'll contact a lawyer this week to get the ball rolling. It's a straightforward 50 50 split. You keep your retirement, and I'll keep mine, Alex declared. But go. You have reservations in town. Use them. Head off to Boston and notch up another victory for you and your team. Alex, please send those texts, Candy implored her voice softer, more pleading. If we lose Leona or Zach before the presentation, the company stands to lose millions. We could miss out on tens, maybe hundreds of thousands in commissions and bonuses. Just imagine all the places we could travel together with that kind of money, just you and me. Forget about this and take me back. Please, Alex, don't let some insignificant fling derail our future. Ben says I'm on the fast track to executive status. All I have to do is maintain our level of productivity for a few more years. Don't you want that for me? For us? She pleaded. Candy, just go. Alex managed to utter before he was struck hard in the back, knocking the wind out of him as he collapsed to the floor with a knee pressed into his back. Don't hurt him. Too badly, Candy instructed. So, the jury's still out on breaking my nose, huh? Ben taunted leaning down to get in Alex's face as he lay pinned on the floor. Candy must have a transmitter, Alex thought bitterly. So, now I know whose team she's playing for. We'll see whose nose gets broken, Ben smirked. Take his phone and send those texts for him. We don't have time for this nonsense. Someone pulled him up from the floor, but it was evident that only one person was responsible. Alex deliberately feigned injury forcing his captor to exert considerable effort in lifting him. This provided him with crucial information. His assailant was evidently an office type, weak and wheezing as he struggled to hoist Alex to his feet. As Alex regained his breath after being blindsided, he focused on regaining his composure and strategizing his next move. Unlike Ben and his team of polished salespeople, Alex's team operated in the field alongside the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, SOAR, out of Fort Campbell, KOI. While his group of engineers might not have matched the elite status of the 160th, they had earned respect by working closely with the crews during test missions. They were invited to participate in physically demanding training sessions under the guidance of seasoned professionals flown in specifically for the purpose. If these men showed up, it usually meant trouble for someone and not the kind one walked away from. Alex and his team developed specialized equipment to facilitate insertion and extraction in high-risk environments. They took pride in knowing their modifications played a vital role in mission success and the safe return of everyone involved. Among the 160th crew, the most respected figure was Master Sergeant, MSGT, Terry Baker. MSGT Baker was a legend in his field, commanding respect from all ranks, from boots to bird colonels. He was renowned for his unwavering commitment to ensuring the safety of his men and had earned his reputation during a mission in Colombia. During an ambush by the FRC, MSGT Baker instructed a young lieutenant to stick close. When the LT was injured in the firefight, the medic pronounced him dead. He's gone top, the medic reported, 
but MSGT Baker refused to accept it and ensured the LT was evacuated safely, embodying the motto of never leaving anyone behind. Baker knelt down and lifted him into a fireman's carry. He's gone, top, the medic reiterated. That may be, Baker replied calmly, but he's still coming home with us. The medic regarded him with disbelief. With more than five kilometers to trek back to the LZ through dense forest, their odds of returning unscathed were slim. Carrying a deceased comrade only compounded their challenges. The MSGT seemed to read the medic's thoughts. I'd do the same for you, Zach, he reassured the medic. Stay close in case I need you. What ensued would become the stuff of legend. Upon their return to the base, the doctor met them as the helicopter touched down. The medic informed the doctor that the lieutenant had succumbed to his injuries. The doctor nodded in understanding and retrieved a pen light from his pocket. The medic watched in astonishment as the supposedly deceased lieutenant's pupils contracted under the harsh beam of the pen light. Care to revise your diagnosis, doctor? The doc asked the medic as they hurried the miraculously revived lieutenant into surgery. Baker was one of those timeless individuals seemingly immune to the passage of time. He spoke sparingly, but his words carried weight, commanding attention from all. He was a relic of a bygone era, in stark contrast to the prevailing ethos of disposability. Handcrafted and irreplaceable, he took a particular interest in Alex and his team. During the downtime between missions, the MSGT expressed his gratitude by imparting basic yet effective hand-to-hand -hand defensive techniques to Alex and his team. He believed it was better to be prepared, just in case. I understand that the biggest threat you're likely to encounter is a jammed copier or a nasty paper cut, but if you remain in this line of work, you may find yourself traveling to some colorful places, MSG to Baker explained to the group. So, if you happen to encounter one of the locals, you'll have something useful to fall back on. Let's just hope a paper cut is the scariest thing you'll ever face. As Alex regained control of his breathing, he allowed himself to slump back into the grasp of his captor, feigning restraint. He recalled the fighting techniques taught by MSGT Baker. There may be situations where you feel helpless and all you can do is endure the beating, the MSGT had advised. But remember, even when you're on the receiving end, you can still fight back. You just need to outsmart your attacker. With this lesson in mind, Alex leaned back into his captor, appearing to passively resist, gradually wearing down the lone man's strength. Give me the phone, Alex, Ben said, looking him straight in the eye. Look, now you know I slept with your wife. Alex, me and all the guys on the team have done it probably more times than you. Forget the macho thing, Alex. You're just another wussy nerd. Do as we ask, and maybe you can get Candy back when the team stops using her. Alex remained silent as Ben took pleasure in humiliating him, coercing him to comply with his demands. Where is it, Alex? Ben demanded, spotting the outline of the phone in Alex's shirt pocket. Ah, there it is, he remarked, reaching for it with his right hand. In a swift move, Alex drove his right heel back, connecting with his captor's shin, and then dragging it down until it collided with his Gucci loafer-clad toes. Flexing his arms, Alex broke free from Ben's grip, causing him to yelp in pain and collapse under the weight of his injured leg. Ben's eyes widened in recognition as Alex executed the move taught by the MSGT. With precision, Alex thrust his right arm straight out, rolling his shoulder as he drove his curled fist into the center of Ben's face with maximum force. The sound of breaking bone echoed as blood gushed from Ben's nose, sending him crashing to the floor. Turning to face his assailant, Alex discovered it was Zack lying on the ground, holding his injured leg and whimpering. I think you broke my foot, Zack complained. Alex responded by stomping down hard on his foot, eliciting a scream of agony. That should remove all doubt, Alex retorted. Returning his attention to Ben, who was now on the floor, Alex observed him struggling to his knees with both hands covering his injured face. Leaning close, Alex whispered in his ear, Looks like your nose took the hit, Ben. I'm just not willing to take one for the team, before delivering a final blow to his temple, rendering Ben unconscious. With his adrenaline surging and his breaths ragged, Alex scanned the living room for candy. 
Suddenly, he felt a jarring impact to the middle of his back and the base of his neck, sending him down to one knee. Swiftly, he spun to confront the new threat, only to find Candy wielding a cast iron skillet. Her swing missed its mark, delivering only a glancing blow to Alex. Rising to his feet, he roughly wrested the pan from her hand. Alex, we can still make it work, Candy pleaded. Think of all the money you'll be throwing away. I'll put an end to all the cheating. I'll stop them, I promise. It'll just be you and me, like old times, Alex. As he rubbed the back of his head with his left hand, Alex looked at Candy, stunned by how quickly she shifted from one demeanor to another. He couldn't help but think of the alien in John Carpenter's The Thing, shape-shifting in response to each new challenge. A wry smile crossed his lips at the comparison. Mistaking his smile for agreement, Candy moved in to embrace Alex. Reacting swiftly, he dropped his left hand from his neck to hold her back. Then, after a moment's consideration, he brought his right hand up and delivered a sharp blow to her nose, not enough to render her unconscious, but sufficient to break bone. Candy cried out in pain and slumped to the floor. Doesn't it hurt like hell? Alex inquired, observing Candy's teary eyes, her impaired vision, and the blood staining her face. Eyes all teared up, can't see, can't breathe, blood all over, works every time. Why did you hit me? Candy cried out. Because I could, he retorted, his phone still recording. Not all of the situation was in his favor, but he believed he had enough to justify his actions. Recalling the advice of the MSGT, Alex surveyed the room. Make up your mind when you can act and don't move until it's right, but once you do, commit everything and don't stop until there ain't no one moving but you. Apart from Zack whimpering in the corner and Candy struggling to stem the flow of blood from her nose, he was the only one in motion. You saved another one, Top, he thought. Doesn't seem like you, lover boy, and Mr. Zack will be in any condition to pitch on Monday. Tough luck missing out on all those millions and big bonuses, Alex remarked. Oh well, I wonder what Nate's going to say when he finds out. Although he intended to call 911, he hesitated. He knew involving the police would limit his opportunity to question Candy. Moving toward her, he knelt beside her as she pressed a dish towel to her face. Pinch the bridge of your nose with your thumb and index finger. Like this, he instructed, demonstrating the proper technique. As the adrenaline rush subsided, Alex suddenly felt drained of energy, collapsing heavily into a seat opposite Candy. Where had his wife gone? The woman sitting across from him was not the same person he saw every day. Once again, he wondered how she had managed to deceive him so thoroughly for so long. Was it worth it? he asked. Candy looked at him and shook her head. It could have been, she said. If you had just gone along, we were so close. After Monday, I would have been on my way to the executive suites. This will set me back. I can fix it, but it will set me back. So, that's all you had in mind? Becoming a VP. Alex said. What about us? The cheating, the lying, would that just continue? Alex, you're so naive, Candy replied. Ben knew that. He told me your black and white ethics and Boy Scout views would hold me back if I let them. He said I had to break out of your control and be my own woman if I wanted to be a success. Did he tell you that before or after he made you a maintenance person on the team? Alex asked. As if you knew the half of it, she spat. Oh, I tried to be the good girl engineer and do all those things that you said would enhance my career. Do you want to know what really works? Alex remained silent, his phone still recording. Well, I'll tell you, my loving husband, all those things you told me weren't working. I was busting my butt making sure all my assignments were on time and budget, and all that got me was a few Ada girls. It wasn't until Leona took me aside that I learned what a woman really needed to do to get ahead. Believe me, a bed on the way to the top works, and it's much easier and more fun. So, this has been going on even before Ben showed up? Alex asked. Oh, for a smart engineer, you can be awfully slow sometimes, Alex, she said. It was at the Christmas party the next year after I joined Cromerica that I served Nate for the first time and never looked back. Wait, you're sleeping with the boss too. Nate. Nate Vandelay. 
Alex asked incredulously. Yes, Alex, Nate, Ben, Zach, anyone on the team that could help me with my career. Even now, you think you have it all figured out. We told Nate where we were going when we headed over here. Right now, he's getting the rest of the team rounded up. They'll be given a cover story about our absence. They'll have to make the pitch without us, but I think the extra effort we put in with their purchasing managers will pay off. Do I really want to hear this? He thought. Oh, what the hell, why not? Extra effort? Alex prodded. You always were a go-getter, Candy. It was so easy. I don't even want to call it an effort, she laughed. It was so easy at the bidders conference with the men that we had to get more creative with Molly, the token woman on the selection committee. Funny how I can even seduce a woman, but I had to involve old man Ben to do it. She was situationally bi-curious. And given the promises that we'd start working together after the contract was finalized, yeah, we got a selection committee. Why all this then? I mean, if it's all greased, why the strong arm stuff? Alex asked. That was Ben's idea, the dumbass. I told him to chill, that I'd come home, make you happy with something, and be back in time to catch a plane, but he had to go to Alpha. Look what that got us. So now, instead of being the face of a winning team, I'll be back to pleasing Nate. Like I said, fixable, but it will set me back. You wouldn't have bought me so cheap, he said. Maybe not, Candy replied, but I still would have made the flight. Well, you sure as hell ain't making that flight now, he said. Remembering how Ben seemed so clued in, he figured that Candy had to have a transmitter with her. Nate, are you listening? I'm about to call the cops. I'm sure there's a handful of felonies involved here, and we haven't even begun to go down the rabbit trail of fraud. That's a federal contract, isn't it, Candy? Alex asked rhetorically. Yeah, the feds take a dim view of how. Did you phrase it? Extra effort. I'm sure you have great lawyers and all, Nate, but maybe there's an alternative. He let it hang. A moment later, Candy's cell phone rang, playing hail to the chief. Nate. She asked into the phone. Of course, I'll put you on speaker. Alex? Nate's voice came through the speaker. First, let me apologize to you. Ben's actions were a gross lapse of judgment. I can assure you the board will deal with him assertively. Thank you, Nate. That is a load off my mind. Glad to see that you and the board take assault and fraud so seriously. Alex, these are all very unfortunate allegations. Lawyers will get rich, but no one really wants to rock the boat. We may pay a fine, Ben and Zach, get some community service, but in the end, you will be divorced and poor by half, Nate explained in a business-like manner. Do I hear an oar in this tale, Nate? Alex asked. Candy always said you were the cleverer of the two. Still, I'm happier to have hired Candy. Yes, Alex, there most decidedly is an or, Nate continued. Alex, we, Crimerica, have displaced you in your wife's affections, and when you found out about this and questioned it, you were treated in a most shabby manner. Most shabby. Shocking. Alex interjected. Alex, Nate continued, in lieu of calling the cops, as you put it, suppose instead that we could come to an agreement. I just sent a snap to Candy's phone, while not me, one of my tech boys here. They tell me that they disappear after viewing. Have a peek. Perhaps that might restore some goodwill. Candy opened the snap and turned the phone to Alex. He saw the words Bank of Grand Cayman and a number. A very large number. And when would that be deposited? Alex asked. It's already there, Alex. You have an email with the account number. This has been a very bad day for you, Alex. This may be a hard decision for you to make, and I don't discount the emotion. Candy is a very desirable woman. Be that as it may, however, one can't take emotion to the bank, can one? One can't, Alex agreed, affecting Nate's upper crust clipped manner of speech. Cromerica will cover the costs of your divorce. You can never reconcile. I think we all recognize that. Candy will file. She will ask for her personal belongings and her retirement. He contemplated for a moment before responding. On one hand, he could stand on principle and expose the whole sordid mess, letting the chips fall where they may. On the other hand, he could simply walk away. 
Mate had just given him five million reasons to do just that. Does Cromerica have a medical staff, Nate? Alex inquired. Ah, uh, yes, Alex. I believe we have some physicians on retainer, Nate replied. Good, Alex said. You better load a few into a limo and send them over here to pick up your team. We are in agreement then, Nate asked. Candy who? Alex retorted. Precisely, Nate agreed. Are we done, Alex? Nate asked. Goodbye, Nate, Alex said, ending the call. Alex put away his phone and turned off the recording app before slipping it back into his pocket. I knew you would see it our way, Alex. We can still be friends, friends with benefits. When this is all over, Candy suggested, attempting to summon what she thought was her most winning smile. However, even her incandescent smile couldn't reverse the effects of her ruined nose. Her eyes were turning black, and dried blood trailed down from her nose to her chin. Alex found the sight somewhat comical and allowed himself a smile. Once again, Candy misinterpreted his smile for agreement and leaned in to kiss him. Alex swiftly put out his right hand to stop her. He cupped her face with his hand and pushed her back until she fell with a thump onto the couch. Either I hit you too hard or not hard enough. In what world would I want to kiss you, Candy? He stated firmly, looking down at her hurt expression. Take whatever you want, but have it out of here tomorrow, Alex said, walking toward the door. He paused next to Zack. Foot still hurt, he asked. Zack responded with a whine. Hell yeah, you bastard, it still hurts. Without another word, Alex delivered a swift kick to Zack's groin causing him to curl up in pain and moan. Moving on to Ben, who had managed to sit up, Alex reassured him, I'm not gonna hit you, Ben. Ben smiled, but his smile vanished as Alex's foot made contact with his testicles. Ben rolled onto his side in agony, and Alex walked out. He climbed into his car, unsure of his destination, but knowing that food and shelter were essential. After grabbing a burger from a nearby takeout place, he checked into a red roof inn just outside of town, near the freeway, and fell asleep as soon as his head hit the pillow. Despite the aches and pains from numerous confrontations, Alex woke early the next morning and dragged his weary body out of bed. He prepared some motel room coffee when his phone chimed, signaling a new message. It was a text from the number. He opened it immediately. Sorry for yesterday. I can meet. TGIF at the mall, noonish. I'll wave you over to seats at the bar. I'll be there, Alex texted back before pouring the lukewarm brown water from the coffee maker's carafe into a paper cup. Yep, I'll be there, he thought as he set up his laptop. Time for some online banking. Back in college, long before he had met Candy, Alex had an economics professor who advocated having at least one offshore account for a rainy day fund. With his professor's help, he soon became the owner of a brand new bank account in the Cayman Islands. It was his Damn You Fund, created as a safety net for unforeseen circumstances. Over the years, he had diligently added to it whenever possible, and now he was proud to have close to $50,000 in his account. Well, his Damn You Fund was about to get a major boost. Alex accessed the secure websites of both banks. With his passcode and a series of keystrokes, he transferred the bulk of Cromerica's payment into his personal account, leaving $100,000 in the original account. After completing the transactions, he took a shower, changed clothes, and got ready to head out to meet the mystery texter. Entering TGIF just after noon, Alex spotted a man waving him over. The man appeared to be around Alex's age, well-dressed and handsome. Alex approached him cautiously. I think you sent me a text, he said as he took a seat. I'm sorry for the way it turned out. I don't know if there was any clean way to tell you, the stranger began. Why don't you start with who you are and your connection to Candy, Alex replied, keeping his guard up. I was on the team, the man began. I left the army after eight years. I got wounded in action and had a long recovery and was medically discharged. I joined Cromerica about six months ago. I was assigned to Ben's team about three months ago. I was telling a friend about the job and mentioned that I was working for Candy. When he asked for her full name, we discovered that we had a mutual friend and he asked me to watch out for Candy as a favor. At first, 
Everything was great. I was welcomed warmly to the team. It didn't take long to find out why, he continued. Candy approached me about two months in. She is extremely attractive and, hmm, compelling, but when I asked her about her ring, she just smiled and told me you were okay with it. I wasn't and said so. That started the deep freeze. After I turned her down, I got all the shit assignments and nothing but grief from Ben. I called our mutual friend back and told him about Candy approaching me. He told me about you and that he thought that pimping your wife for pay seemed out of character for the man he knew. He thought there was more to it than Candy let on and that you needed to know. Ben sent me the pick when they were trying to get me on board with the team, kind of a prize I could expect if I went along. Let's just say that I don't agree with their methods. I guess I'm a straight arrow. I resigned yesterday and sent you the text. Our friend, Alex asked. Terry Baker. If I hadn't met Terry, he replied, then stopped a moment before he went on. Let's just say he helped me out of a scrape when I was a green LT. I owe him a favor or two. Don't we both, Alex agreed. What are you going to do? The stranger asked. Nate kind of laid it all out for me. I could get the cops involved and yes, Zach and Ben and even Candy would have some legal problems, but with his lawyers, it would all end up as a bump in the road. We made a deal. You might think I'm selling out and maybe you're right in a way. But they stole the only thing I had that was irreplaceable. If I can't make them pay legally, well, at least I can make them pay. It won't bring Candy back, but I think I may find she's less irreplaceable than I thought. I have a trip planned. Tell Terry thanks for everything. I won't be going back to work. What about you? Alex asked finally. Well, Terry always spoke highly of Baxter Incorporated. Now that you're gone, they may just need another engineer. I think you'll find they do business a bit differently at Baxter. Maybe more to your liking. Challenging, but the fringe benefits won't compare to what Candy's team was offering. Alex smiled. I think I can live with that. The stranger rose. Alex did likewise. They simply nodded to each other and left without a further word. On Monday, Alex had just checked in for his flight to Costa Rica. Tamarindo will be a nice place to decompress for a while. He thought. He was making his way toward security and saw a mailbox just up ahead. He reached into his pocket and pulled out an envelope addressed to the DOJ, Washington, D.C. Inside was a thumb drive of the recording. They might be interested. Who knows? He thought. Maybe Nate's lawyers aren't as good as he thinks. He dropped the envelope in the box and walked into the security line. Epilogue. Nine months later. Alex sat at his usual table in the cafe. Nicole, lovely as always, brought him his cerveza. Thank you, dear, he said as he raised the bottle to his lips. He had received mail. Still holding the envelope, he examined it. No return address. He wondered who had found him. He hadn't gone through elaborate steps to stay hidden, but locating him in a little town on the Pacific coast of northern Costa Rica would have required resources beyond the ordinary. His first thought was Nate's people had found him. The envelope had been sitting at his house for two days. He was fairly certain it wasn't a bomb, yet one couldn't be too careful. Travis, Alex called out to the owner of the cafe. Tiani's Tusk Cuchillo. See, sinner Alex. Travis handed over the envelope, and Alex took a few steps back. Can never be too careful, he thought as Travis cut open the envelope. He handed it back to Alex, who thanked him. Alex took another pull from his beer bottle and turned the envelope over. Several sheets of paper fell onto the table. He picked up a note. Thought you would find this interesting. That was all the note said, and instead of a signature, there was a phone number, the number. Terry would have the resources to find him, he thought. I can live with that. He flipped the other piece of paper over. It was a copy of a newspaper article with a picture. The photo showed Ben, Zach, Candy, and Leona being led out of the Cromerica building in handcuffs. The headline for the article read, Four Indicted in Multi-Million Dollar Procurement Fraud. He smiled. Maybe Nate's lawyers aren't everything he thought they were, he said to himself, a habit he picked up since his Spanish was weak and English wasn't widely spoken. He liked to hear English conversation even if it was just him talking to himself.
Nicole, Otra surveys a poor favor, he said as he held up his empty bottle. Say, Mr. Alex. Gracias, Nicole, he said as he accepted his beer, took a swallow, and looked out at the deep blue Pacific. Candy who? Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.